Our next presenter is uh, Russell Blackford. We have the extraordinary evidence, exclamation point, science, skepticism, and denialism. Russell is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Evolution and Technology, uh, which makes him a Borg, I guess. Um, he's a fellow of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, and in the store is his, another fantastic book, uh, Freedom of Religion and the Secular State. Uh, here is his haiku. We say we have proof. Tests, data, studies, yes, proof. To them, not so much. Please welcome Russell Blackford. Indulge me for one moment, folks, while I just say how pleased and privileged I feel to be speaking at this great event. I've come 8,000 miles to, to speak here, but I, I find myself surrounded by all these welcoming, friendly, and refreshingly you know, ras rational and reasonable people, and I feel very much at home. So thank you to, to JREF, and thank you all for all that. When DJ Grothy asked me if I would speak at this convention, I felt honoured, but I also felt some trepidation. I thought, well, what can I really say to a bunch of hardened, seasoned scientific sceptics, right? I'm, I'm not a magician, I'm not a scientific investigator, I'm not any sort of scientist, I'm a philosopher. So I thought, what can I say that might be helpful? But I think I can offer as a philosopher some kind of perspective that may be of interest to you. And in offering that perspective, I'm going to ask you to cast your minds back 500 years. I'm not a magician, I can't do that for you. And I don't know about any of you, but I'm not old enough to remember that far back. Uh, and I don't believe in reincarnation, which is something which will come up later in the talk. However, we have good historical records. We have good records of what was happening 500 years ago, at least in many parts of the world. And so we can rely upon the, the collective memory that's available to us. So I'm going to make some comparisons between, let's say, 1513 and 2013. The lesson here, the lesson that I'll be trying to draw, is that what once seemed like ordinary, or at least acceptable, claims in 1513 might be extraordinary claims now. And what would have been an extraordinary claim then might now, in the relevant sense to us, have become an ordinary one. And that's not because I take some relativist approach to knowledge, it's not anything like that. It's because the evidence that's reasonably available to people has changed so much in those 500 years. In particular, I want you to think of European civilization in 1513. That was four years before Martin Luther confronted the indulgent seller Johann Tetzel with his famous 95 Theses, catalyzing the Protestant Revolution. It was 30 years before the publication of Copernicus's major work on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres. It was about a century before Galileo's great scientific discoveries that arguably mark the beginning of modern science, and it was 300 years or more before Darwin. So, there's our historical perspective 500 years ago. 1513 versus 2013. People in Europe 500 years ago were in effect living in another world. That is to say, the information available to them at that time was radically different from what is available to us today, so much so that it's no wonder that they understood the world very differently. The celebrated Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor has written something along these lines. He's carried out an exercise, a similar exercise, to the one I'm asking of you when you cast your minds back 500 years ago. His exercise is specifically about the existence of God and the truth of Christianity. Now, Taylor is actually a religious believer. His book, uh, A Secular Age, is not a book advocating atheism. 
If you want a book like that, there are plenty available, and one more that will be available uh, later this year is my new book with Udo Schuklenk, 50 Great Myths About Atheism. That's not really what Taylor is on about. But in his 2007 book, A Secular Age, he discusses how things changed during that period of time to enable a movement from a society where belief in God was essentially unchallenged to the current situation in Western societies where belief in God is, as Taylor puts it, understood to be one option among others and frequently not the easiest to embrace. So that's, that's Taylor's book, A Secular Age, published in 2007. I should say that A Secular Age won the much coveted Templeton Prize, but we're not going to hold that against the book, right? <laughs> OK. As Taylor describes it, it was virtually impossible or even unthinkable in, say, 1500, he says, in 1513, whatever the date we choose, especially unthinkable not to believe in God. Well, what has changed? Taylor identifies you know, a range of features of 16th century life in Europe that made the existence of God just obvious, just obvious to everybody. And some of those points that he identifies apply more widely than belief in God. So first, he said, yeah, the natural world was seen as testifying to divine activity, whether it was the regularities of the natural world or whether it was extraordinary events such as plagues and droughts and floods or even extraordinary good events. You know, such as seasons of a particularly fruitful harvest. All of that was imagined within the ideology of the time as attesting to the action of God, either maintaining regularity or interfering with these, you know, these acts of God, these extraordinary events. And that idea was not challenged. You know, that, was, that was the common kind of understanding. Second, if you lived in Europe in the 16th century, the whole political and social system was closely integrated with the religious system. At all levels of society, it was just assumed that human activity was underpinned by the activity of God and all communal life was pervaded with this. All communal life was pervaded by ritual and worship. Uh, thirdly, there was a strong sense, this is very important actually, there's a strong sense for 16th century Europeans of living in an enchanted cosmos full of miraculous beings and powers. Now, a lot of people are still living in that enchanted cosmos. Right? A lot of people still have that kind of mentality. But that was the common mentality back then, and there was no real reason to think otherwise. There's no real reason to challenge it. No authority you could go to would be challenging that idea, that that was the kind of world that we, if we cast ourselves back to 500 years ago, no authority would tell you anything other than that was the world we were living in. And furthermore, as Taylor adds, there was simply no well-developed alternative. There was no well-developed naturalistic, secular alternative to religion and to what we'd now regard as superstition. So, OK, that's what Taylor says about life back then. In, in my view, Taylor's book underestimates the degree to which science in particular changed things, though there are a number of factors that changed things. Uh, urbanisation changed the way we live together and perceive the world. Uh, there are economic changes. But very importantly, there are scientific changes in the way we perceive the world. And science was transformative. In 1513, science as we now know it was in the future. Uh, yeah, Copernicus was still a fair way away, 30 years away to his great work. Galileo was still a yeah, hundred years away. You know, Galileo's first great observations with the telescope were 1609 and 1610. So that's a century away to what arguably is the beginnings of modern science. Uh, even humanistic learning, such as in various kinds of textual and historical scholarship, you know, was at a relatively early age, despite the Renaissance, which had started in Italy in the 14th century. If you were living in the 17th century, you'd have no reason to doubt stories of supernatural events such as miracles, hauntings, the effects of evil spill, spells cast by witches, and all the rest of it. it. It was well known to be 
to, to, to be sure that some seeming miracles probably had natural explanations. It was well known uh, that some holy relics were fakes, uh, that some miracles were supposedly fraudulent. Uh, there's reference to this in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, for example, which was written you know, a couple of hundred years earlier still. Uh, there's even references in St. Augustine's work written you know, a, a thousand years before when we're talking about, or more than a thousand years, well, well over a thousand years before we're talking about. So, you yeah, know, we have Chaucer's partner, which Christopher Hitchens often refers to. You know, he often talks, talked about his opponents, who he was denigrating as Chaucerian frauds, meaning like, like this guy, the pardoner. Um, Hitchens made that famous comment that when Jerry Falwell died, that if you gave Falwell an enema, you could bury him in a matchbox, right? <laughs> well, yeah, this guy and his horse, if you gave them both an enema, you could stick them in that funny hat that he's wearing. You know, there were these people that were full of bullshit and it was known, but all the same, even if you thought that miracles and genuine relics were not here and now, you'd think they were not very far away. And you'd have no reason to believe that these things didn't exist. You'd have no reason to think you did not live in this kind of enchanted cosmos that we've been talking about. Now today, of course, ordinary people still have problems knowing just who to trust, who has genuine expertise, we do live in a propaganda society, and we know that much of what we read or hear is misinformation, um, particularly when we turn on Fox News or the like, but at least we're in a position to examine who might be genuinely qualified to talk on a particular topic. In the 16th century, there was no particular reason for an educated person yeah, to doubt the, the church authorities, for example, or any of the authorities that told them they lived in a world where supernatural forces were at work and supernatural events took place, if not here, at least nearby. And conversely, this is important, there was no reason to trust anybody who made such seemingly bizarre claims as that the Earth revolves around the Sun and rotates on its axis, that the Earth is billions of years old, that human beings are descended from ape-like forebears, or that the sacred history of the Jews laid out in the Hebrew Bible you know, is pretty much false. There's no reason to trust somebody who said those things. Those were extraordinary claims. A reasonable person would have had no reason to believe those sorts of claims. Everything about the way society was structured, anything any authority told you, you know, would have gone against believing claims like that. Those were extraordinary claims. From the point of view of someone living in 16th century Europe, you know, those claims were, were anomalous in relation to everything that they knew or could trust uh, 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 of what they were told about the world. If I had the time, and I, I, I don't on this occasion, I'd go into some detail about how a dramatic claim, such as the claim that the Earth rotates, so controversial in the era of Galileo, how that claim was actually established. Um, Galileo had to establish that in a situation where that claim hardly even made sense to people. He had to do a lot of arguing, a lot of hardcore scientific world to challenge what was seemingly the common sense view that the Earth is stationary. Right? Uh, if you've never done so, please read some detailed accounts of just what Galileo had to do, how he went about this. For example, uh, you could read Philip Kitcher's wonderful book, The Advancement of Science from back in 1995. For example, Galileo had to respond to the argument that if the Earth rotates, uh, if you drop an object from the top of a tower, why doesn't the object fall, as it were, behind the tower? That seemed to be the common sense sort of thing you'd expect. And, and of course, Galileo put the counter argument, well, what if you drop an object from the top of a ship's, a ship's mast? He, you know, he said, well, you'll find it doesn't fall be behind the ship's mast. And that illustration made some kind of sense for sea going culture. But you know, he had to put detailed argument and produce the evidence. To overcome common sense views like that, why don't things fall behind us when we drop them? I mean, if I drop my glasses now, it should fall slightly one way because if the Earth's rotating, right? That was the common sense way of looking at things. It is not obvious that the Earth is going to rotate in a world where we don't have the science that makes that picture even thinkable. So Galileo had to make that, that thinkable. And similarly, the claim that we're descended through a naturalistic process from earlier primates. That was a truly extraordinary claim. 
Yeah, until the evidence was actually gathered, and of course far more evidence has been gathered augmenting what Darwin had available to him about 150 years ago. So the main point of this talk is that modern naturalistic ideas of the world, the modern naturalistic picture that we have, a picture that even most religious people operate with you know, from day to day, when they're getting their car repaired, they don't call for the priest to exercise it. You know, they call for the mechanic to try to work out what's wrong with the engine. That did not come naturally. That is not intuitive to human beings. That's not something that just comes to us without a lot of hard work. That view of the world was hard won. Extraordinary knowledge was won through extraordinary efforts by Copernicus, by Galileo, by Newton, by Darwin, and by many others, including people whom we normally regard as humanity scholars rather than scientists. For someone living in 1513, many of the most basic claims in our scientifically informed view of the world would once again have been extraordinary claims. And the reason why we now quite rightly accept them is because we actually have the extraordinary evidence accumulated over those hundreds of years. Right? So that's the perspective that I, I want to offer. Don't even start me, by the way, on things like relativity theory or quantum theory and on how intuitive they are. Um, you know, the universe opened up for our inspection by the advancement of science is actually very strange indeed. And much of what we have learned in that time frame has gone against all our natural intuition. So I won't read this quote from Edward O. Wilson. I don't know if you can all read it in this large room, but you know, Wilson um, you know, has this quote in which he says, among other things, um, the cost of scientific advance is the humbling recognition that reality was not constructed to be easily grasped by the human mind. You know, there's been a huge historical effort to move from what might be intuitive to us to this modern uh, conception of the world that's informed by science. Now, I said don't even start me on relativity and quantum mechanics. They're not, say, for a non-scientist like me, let alone for, say, primary school children. But what I do say is there is an exciting story to tell. There's, a, there's an exciting story to tell about the advance of science and about just how that scientific knowledge was won. Now, how did Galileo actually convince people in the 17th century? And where Galileo left off, Galileo died in 1642 and Newton was born in the same year. You know, how did the scientists following Galileo actually get it to the point where we had the evidence for what seemed like us obvious things like the Earth rotates? There's a very exciting story to be told about that. And that story should be you know, told more often and more filling, more, more fully. I think we should introduce our children to that story as early as possible in their education. And we can always learn more about that story ourselves. I take it that there was some discussion on the panel I was on yesterday about scientific scepticism, right? I take it that when we talk about scientific scepticism, well, we're certainly not talking about scepticism about science. What, what we're really talking about is scepticism about claims that educated people who are informed by science should now regard as extraordinary. And they're not regarded as extraordinary, really, because they are intrinsically bizarre or unintuitive. That's not really the problem. A, a lot of these sorts of claims under different conditions without being informed by science are not necessarily unintuitive at all. It's actually, in many cases, the findings of science that don't come naturally to human beings. So the point about these extraordinary claims is not that they are somehow intrinsically bizarre or intrinsically unintuitive to us or that they're just you know, crazy on their, on their face, devoid of any cultural context. The point is that they are anomalous within our hard-won, scientifically informed picture of the world. And the way that scientifically informed picture of the world was hard-won is, as I say, an exciting story that we all need to, we all need to know more about. 
Think again of reincarnation. Now that's an idea that seems pretty intuitive in a lot of cultures, right? But if reincarnation were true, if reincarnation were a phenomenon that actually takes place, if we found that out, it would force us to revise our entire picture of the world. We would need to find some mechanism whereby reincarnation can take place, and that would change our entire world picture. That is what makes the idea of reincarnation extraordinary, what makes it extraordinary within our hard-won scientific picture of the universe, not because it's intrinsically bizarre compared to any other idea, without all that hard work that has gone in by science over the past 500 years. Now, reincarnation is an extraordinary claim in our sense. It is a claim that would change everything. It is a claim that is anomalous within our scientific picture of the world. And therefore, it is the sort of claim that requires scrutiny. Um, there's reason to investigate it in what I would say is in a spirit of suspicion. And now by way of analogy, I mean, we're talking about scientific scepticism, scepticism about you know, extraordinary claims that are anomalous given everything we know from science, from what's been put in by science over the past hundreds of years. But by analogy, there are other claims that are anomalous given the knowledge we have. I mean, some people, as we said yesterday, some people deny the authenticity of, of Shakespeare's plays, or at least the authenticity of Shakespeare's uh, composition of those plays. A lot of people tell you, you know, the Earl of Oxford wrote them, or Christopher Marlowe wrote them, or, or Francis Bacon wrote them, or whatever. People will make those claims in, in the humanities. And, and by analogy, you know, here we have claims that are made in the face of overwhelming evidence. And some people will deny other things. Some people, for example, will deny you know, terrible truths that we have from history. They will deny terrible historical events such as the, the Holocaust. There was a time, ladies and gentlemen, when the claim that the Nazis murdered nearly six million Jews in their concentration camps, there was a time when that claim should have been regarded with suspicion, especially because there was so much in the way of false propaganda that was spread about the Germans in the First World War. That, you know, I, it'd be worth your while you know, digging out the, the information about the propaganda campaigns by the countries allied with us in the First World War. Given that experience, there was a time when it would have been reasonable to be suspicious about that, that claim. And we should, in fact, always be suspicious about atrocity propaganda, especially the atrocity propaganda promulgated by our own side because it's all too easy to believe that kind of propaganda. However, the fact of the matter is that the Nazi Holocaust did take place. We, we have the extraordinary evidence that was required to convince us that those horrific events took place, and we have that evidence in much detail. You know, given the picture that was built up by investigators immediately after the Second World War and by historians since, we actually do have the extraordinary evidence needed to believe in the occurrence of something as vast and horrific as the, the Holocaust. Someone who now denies those events, someone who now denies those events in the face of that accumulation of evidence, does not deserve the honourable title of sceptic. They are in denial of the evidence and they deserve the title denialist. Right. We live in a society where there are many kinds of denialism, many kinds of suspicion of claims that do not deserve the honourable title of scepticism. Ladies and gentlemen, those extraordinary claims that actually acquire extraordinary evidence thereby change our picture of the world. And in the case of something like the Holocaust, they change much of the picture of how we understand you know, humanity and history and our, and our place in it. Once extraordinary 
claims are established by the evidence, of course, they become normalised. Once they are sufficiently well established, those once extraordinary claims can then be used in arguments against new claims that are inconsistent with them. And, and when that happens, all of that cumulative evidence that supports such a claim then stands as evidence against any inconsistent claim. So think, for example, of the rotation of the Earth. That was once an extraordinary claim. And the onus was on proponents, such as Galileo, to gather the evidence. Uh, Scepticism about that claim was rational and warranted. What was not rational and warranted, of course, was locking Galileo under house arrest for the rest of his life, you know, trying to suppress his work. But, but, but suspicion and scepticism and investigation, um, you know, in, in a mood of suspicion, that was warranted, but the evidence was gathered. Someone who denied that claim now would not deserve the title of sceptic, an earth rotation sceptic, if there was such a thing, you know, would, would, not be, would not deserve the honourable title sceptic. Such a person would be a crackpot or a denialist or something else, a crank perhaps. Don't ask me just what the difference is. You could have an interesting talk perhaps on what is the difference between a crank, a denialist and a crackpot, but they'd be one of those, okay? And we have in our society now Holocaust denialists. We have climate change denialists. We have evolution denialists. And we have denialists of many other important claims for which we do actually have the accumulation of the evidence. We have denialists of claims for which extraordinary evidence probably was needed, but that evidence has been gathered. Um, and this distinction between a sceptic in the honourable sense and a denialist, that is a distinction that needs to be more widely understood. Our children need to be taught that distinction just as they need to be taught what I was saying earlier. They need to be taught about how hard won our current evidentially informed picture of the world actually was. I don't believe those things are well understood by our, our children generally. They might be understood by your children, but they don't, they're not generally understood by the children in our society. And generally speaking, they're not well understood even by adults. So I, I suppose the challenge, the bottom line here is let's do more about that. Thank you for your attention, colleagues and friends. My very last slide was a thank you slide which said um, question times here, but the question time will have to be in the Delray Lounge, I think. But may we have good conversations about these issues wherever we have those conversations. Thank you once again, friends and colleagues, and thank you to Jay Ruth for having me here. Thank you, Russell Blackford. Russell Blackford.